This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Well, Dan Pickering, mate, thanks very much for taking the time to come on on Talk Your Book. We don't get a heap of crypto experts, but I'm always excited when we do. So maybe before we dive into the, the, the world that is crypto, if we could start with listed reserve and a little bit about your history and, uh, and how you guys to invest yeah we we started back in 2018 so we're going up to our fifth anniversary now so um i've been interested in in the sector for quite a while before that uh, and had had used the assets and um, we decided it'd be a a pretty good idea actually to launch a fund at the time back in 2018 people really struggled sort of getting access to these assets They, they really didn't understand what was going on uh, it was a pretty difficult year, 2018. I don't know if you remember, things were the chips were down and uh, everything was down sort of 50 to 60 percent that year. Actually, turned out to be a great year to start a fund. Uh, and yeah, now we're, we're into our into our fifth year, um, and things are, are going well. The whole sector's come an awful long way since then. We get a lot more interest now from sort of uh, you know institutions and pension funds. Back in back in the early days, we, we couldn't get a meeting, but things are changing, so it's good. And it's such a wildly volatile sector and, and completely different to a lot of other sectors investors have experience with. How do you manage that with, with the clients that give you money? Is there a lot of work in really explaining to them what they're getting in for or by the time they come to you, do they sort of understand the landscape and, and what, they're, what they're buying into? Well, I, I think the way we deal with it is we're just straightforward and honest and just say, look, this is a volatile sector and at some point you will be down um, somewhere from 40 to 50% from where you've been at, at another point in the journey. That's happened to um, you know, nearly all of our investors. Like we're currently uh, in a drawdown of sort of 30% from where we were uh, in October last year. And yet the fund's still up sort of seven times over the, over the five years we've been doing it. So uh, we just tell investors, look, be in for uh, you know, at least four to five years, expect drawdowns, We've had at least three. Uh, we expect more of them to come, and there will be more of them to come. Uh, and you know, generally, they represent good opportunities. Or at least they have, have in the past. And if you're starting a crypto discussion, I guess it makes sense to start with. Um, I guess it starts makes sense to start with Bitcoin and the other layer ones. How are you sort of viewing the world? Do you think we're going to live in a, a multi-chain world? Are you a, a fan of you know the the, the, the mod, modular protocol idea that Things will be built on top of each other, the sort of layer two thesis. Um, you know, Solana has been popular with a lot of crypto investors recently. How are you viewing the landscape broadly and where are you guys zeroing in on? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's, there's two different things happening. I think the, the competition for um, money and value uh, is essentially is one and, and Bitcoin is the winner there. And, I, I you know, we're... You know, we're sort of heavily invested in that core asset. Um, we think it, it, it solved a key problem. If you look at the sort of our macro thesis is essentially, uh, if you look around the first world, most economies have a money supply that doubles every six years. Now, it, that doesn't work. So, you know, traditional money has ceased to function as money. Uh, and we look to uh, Bitcoin as a tremendous solution to that. We think it solved that problem and we think it's the category winner. And when I say category winner, I think it's going to be the ultimate reference point for value for everything. So in 10 years time, your fund managers are going to be standing up and saying, look, I, I returned 6% against Bitcoin, right? There's, to me, there's no point standing up and saying, you know, we did 12% this year against the US dollar when, you know, there were 50% more US dollars in existence. It, you know, you've gone backwards in my mind. And so it also means, sorry to jump in, it also means that in 20 years' time, if that world exists, people will look back at the last 10 years and go, wow, look, look how much house prices crashed. We put out, we put out a, a sort of piece on that. We, re, we basically rebased Australian house prices in Bitcoin, in the NASDAQ, uh, and in, in the ASX, right? Now, against the NASDAQ and Bitcoin, Australian house prices, are, they're collapsing. Yeah. 
but everyone's high-fiving because they're high-fiving against a denominator that is essentially fudged. So um, we think there's a sort of tremendous amount of value to go for our core asset Bitcoin, which is to me the ultimate layer one. And then there's everything else and there's all to play for in everything else. So, you know, where we get to in terms of layer twos, I think remains to be seen, but, but I think there's a, a really good case for them. And I think if you look at um, this, the whole world of stable coins, for example, which generally operate on Ethereum and the other layer twos, they've been tremendously um, successful, right? There's, there's nearly $200 billion in US dollar stable coins now. People are actively selecting to use um, different iterations of a US dollar because they're, they're much more useful than, than the original version. So, I mean, that's just one example of how those you know, the sort of non-Bitcoin tokens are sort of taking over finance. I think it will continue. Which platform is ultimately successful? I think there'll be, I think there'll be, you know, many of them in, in that area. And so the Bitcoin, if we just go back to that just for a second, I think the view that Bitcoin as a store of value is the winner is, well, it's consensus in, in the crypto world, but sort of as a medium exchange, it feels like that's still not quite consensus due to the volatility. I think there's a view that, you know, stable coins will still play a role for merchants for years to come because they'll feel more comfortable pricing things in a currency they're more familiar with and, and, and one that is less volatile. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I think that, that's correct. And I think that's half the success of stable coins, right? But most of the world is still denominated in US dollars, right? There's no, there's no getting away from that. And I think if you look at um, the people that generally use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, are the sort of hardcore Bitcoiners, right? So, for example, I mean, we've got a guy that does um, artwork for us in Europe and we pay him in Bitcoin using the Lightning Network, right? But he's sort of, I consider him an industry participant. I think it, we're, we're, we're quite some way away from the point at which Bitcoin is the reference point for value and is generally accepted, right? But as far as I'm concerned, that's good. That's good for our fund because when we get to the point where we're at general acceptance and it is a medium of exchange, the days of sort of super normal returns have probably gone. So, you know, I'd say we're a decade away from that. Uh, and you've got, you know, the US dollar's got tremendous um, momentum from its historic use. I mean, it's not going to be, it's not going to be removed tomorrow, next week, next year. You know, this is a decades project. And so in terms of stable coins, then we've got most major governments, um, you know, talking now about building a central bank digital currency. Do you think there, there is some regulatory risk around the, the, the stable coins, particularly the US stable coin, now that their governments, well, I think for now, they're just exploring the idea, but, but I'm sure soon enough, they'll be building their own. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at China, right, and China, China's been a long way ahead in payments for a long time. I mean, if you, you, you I know that you've been there, but it, everything is digital payments in China. Their central bank, bank digital currency is already out in the wild, right? It's been tested in a province in China already. So there, you know, the, the Federal Reserve only announced they're looking at it sort of a few weeks ago. So China's sort of four or five years in front already on this. Um, but it, as to regulatory risk, yeah, I think there is significant regulatory risk in, in stable coins. Um, but I, I took a lot of comfort from Tether and their case against the New York Attorney General. It, effectively, Tether won that case, like hands down against probably the most aggressive group of lawyers that you could, you could come up against in the world. So uh, that gave me tremendous confidence in Tether and stable coins. Um, I, I think what you're going to find is it's it's governments that are the ones that are, they're going to have to create their uh, digital currencies that are sufficiently competitive with stable coins that people actually want to use them, right? So they need to be as compelling as the stable coins are for people to move across. So I really think that, that the charge into central bank digital currencies being led by stable coins, I think they're front running governments and governments are playing catch up. And have you had a look at the algorithmic stable coins and do you think they play a role? Do you think it'll be a more easy to understand stable coin that, that's backed by an actual US dollar that'll be the one that wins in the end? I, I do think it will be uh, the, the sort of more straightforwardly constructed ones that will win in the end, right? And the, the algorithmically backed stable coins, they really lend themselves to uh, specialized traders and market makers that, that sort of know what's happening, right? So 
you can get um, tremendous opportunities for trading in those stable coins where they go out of balance, right? And the assumption is, with an algorithmically backed one, that well, the market's efficient and it will just it will just correct, right? But that's not what has happened so far, right? Because there isn't perfect information. There isn't perfect technical skill against participants, right? So I might know more about how one works than you do, and you might know more about another one. And so they're always slightly off. And to me, simplest is best and, and simplest will win because you've got to win over people's minds, right? You don't want to be explaining this complex system. People will be like, yeah, I'm out. So yeah, simpler the better is my view. So do you prefer a USDC over a Tether for that reason? Well, I mean, I think if you look at our fund where we use stable coins for trade, we actually use Tether, right? Because it's sort of more widely accepted, easier for us to use for a number of reasons. But we don't sit in stable coins, right? It's just a it's just a transition mechanism. You know, we'd be in them for three seconds, and so you know, I don't I don't see it as something I'm going to sort of hold my value in. I don't really have a preference, right? Because I only take the counterparty risk for you know the minimum amount of time I possibly can. Your treasury is never kept in it. No. And so, in terms of um, we may have some Ethereum fans watching. You, you mentioned that Bitcoin's the market leader, and the rest is is almost up for grabs in, in terms of layer one land. We know the ETH merge is, is due in the middle of this year, if I'm correct. It's meant to be around August, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's been, it's been due, due for a while if we're, if we're sort of, if we're honest about the sort of uh, number of times it's been announced, it's technically very difficult. So yeah, the latest estimate is mid this year. And so maybe explain if you can in layman's term, what that merge entails and whether or not, if that goes through without a hitch, if you start to change the tune and feel that perhaps that's that's closer to creating a moat than, than the other layer one that's competing with. Well, well, I think, look, Ethereum has been a tremendous success, right? There's no doubt about that. And I think um, Bitcoiners owe a debt of gratitude to Ethereum, right? Because Ethereum gave rise to stable coins, which gave rise to, um, trade in Bitcoin. It was tremendously useful and still is for traders. And plus, Ethereum's tested a lot of things um, that sort of haven't worked and they've, you know, they've gone out there and taken risk and all the rest of it, right? So it's been actually a tremendous boon to Bitcoin Ethereum. I think the issue it's got is that there's a, a great deal of technical risk associated with things they've done in the past uh, and things they're planning to do in the future. And I just think that the technical risk is not well understood in terms of what's being built and what's being proposed. So the idea of the merge, essentially that the merge will take big, uh, Ethereum to proof of stake and, and away from proof of work, um, which will benefit participants because the fees will be lower and um, you know it, it will be faster and transaction throughput will be higher and all the rest of it, but which is, which is fine. I think that's a perfectly valid approach. My concern is, A, that you've got the technical risk, but B, if you're going to go down the road of cheaper and faster, there's always another iteration that can come that's cheaper and faster, right? We saw that on Tether. We saw billions of dollars migrate and the fees got high on Ethereum. They just went to Tron, if it was sort of 18 months ago, right? And you can always um, move to a cheaper and faster chain. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't accrete value to the holder in the end. And so it's kind of a race to the bottom in a way. And that's what sort of, if I have a concern, that is my concern about Ethereum. But let, let's be honest about Ethereum. They have a tremendously committed group of developers and they have a lot more developers than Bitcoin has. Uh, and I certainly don't wanna write those people off because um, anything is possible. And while their plans are hugely ambitious, and I think they are hugely ambitious. I think they're hugely risky. We're not betting against them, right? Ethereum's in our fund. Um, and, and, you know, it's not, a, it's not a huge position. It's about 8%. And so, look, I hope they're successful, but it is risky. And one of those things that's been experimented on and, and built on top of Ethereum has, has been NFTs. And they're pretty much uh, common popular vernacular now. Most people have some level of understanding of what they are. How are you viewing that NFT landscape? And, and what do you think, you know, board apes selling for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, what do you think that's telling us about the future importance, if anything, of NFTs? 
Well, I, I think they're probably they're front running this, this idea of sort of digital worlds, right? So um, to me, if I take a sort of raw NFT that's perhaps not famous, so I put the board apes to one side, right? Because I, yeah. I think they are valuable. I think the punks are valuable and I think they always will be. So what, and why, why is that? Because I think they've got the sort of scarcity first mover um, advantage. I think they're sufficiently well known now um, that, you know, that there's enough people in the world and there's even enough people in, in sort of crypto that want one to sustain their value, right? You, you only need someone to want it for it to be valuable. You know, I don't need to make some profound argument about why NFTs are valuable other than to say, well, last week one sold for a quarter of a million dollars and that's what they're worth, right? The market's speaking. Now, and particularly for this, those sort of top tier NFTs, but I think as we go forward, uh, when you're talking about the sort of mass market sort of NFTs, I think they work much better in, in what I call closed loop ecosystems, right? So they're much more suitable for uh, video game environments and digital environments than they are for, um, you know, if I put a TV on my wall and I'm displaying my NFT, it's kind of nonsense that, right? Because there's no validation. Um, and, and the person looking at it can't actually, doesn't know, is it real or is it just a JPEG, right? Inside a software program, inside a video game, the software does the work. It validates if it's real, right? And, and people, we already know from people's behavior in let's say Instagram, right? It, essentially Instagram is just our platform for showing off, right? Like most of the, what you see there, it's not real. But it doesn't matter, right? And and what matters is what people behave, how they how they behave, and what they spend their money on. And and I can see their behaviour in Instagram and go, well, okay, that's how they behave. And so NF, they're going to be chucking NFTs in there. We know that Zuckerberg's building the software to sort of validate this stuff. And it's like you can stand there with your expensive handbag, or you can display your expensive NFT. And essentially, it's just social signaling, I am rich, or, you know, I am interested in this thing. And people will do it. There's a market for it. And so, um, you know, whether you sort of uh, fundamentally disagree that behind it, there's anything, uh, it doesn't matter. Behind it, people believe it. And we've seen that in the market. And so there's going to be something there. I just think there are certain ecosystems where they'll work really well and other ecosystems where they won't. And I think the ecosystems where they work really well aren't yet ready. Um, and I'm talking metaverse, the, the video games, et cetera. And so we might get to that in a second, but if we were to park sort of profile picture NFTs and, and digital gaming uh, objects, NFTs, if you, if you think about, say, more functional NFTs, and I guess if we take a, a view that of, of what the world would look like, the physical world would look like if there were no property rights and that idea that people probably wouldn't bother painting their fence or mowing their lawns or putting too much effort in and perhaps wouldn't treat each other as well as they do now because there's less to risk because they don't own anything. When you then go onto Twitter and see how people behave with no digital property rights, do you think NFTs and, and Web3, if you like, does have a chance to improve the discourse that, that we see online because all of a sudden, Sudden people can take their username or their followers with them to a, a different platform if they're being censored or not being treated well? Um, or is this an unrealistic idea and, you know, the social media toilet experience that, that many have is here to stay and only going to get worse? Yeah, I'm not sure that NFTs are going to, are going to alter people's behaviour necessarily. So I mean, if you look at the behaviour on, um, uh, say, say, Twitter, like, you know, crypto Twitter, like... It's savage, right? It, it, it can be really, really brutal, inappropriate, and um, but it's a testing ground for ideas, right? I must say, I find it net, it's it's beneficial because when somebody puts something out there that is clearly ridiculous, it just gets decimated by other people on the platform. Now, there's ways of doing that which aren't, um, you know, you don't need to be rude about it. Uh, and I, I, I find that the sort of, on average, the level of discourse is, is pretty good. I don't think that, um, or actually, I don't know if it's good, but it's net beneficial, let's put it that way. Um, and I don't know that um, the introduction of NFTs will necessarily change that. I think what you might find is that, that, that it'll be the platforms that change that. So 
you know, if we get to, um, I don't, and we need to sort of get away from Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of it and get to sort of proper platforms that are decentralized, but it, it'll be the audience that regulates the content. That's what you want. You don't want Twitter regulating the content. You want people regulating the content. So if you behave in a way that the majority of people is inappropriate, you're out. And I think that's where things will go, uh, which is not necessarily sort of related to, to NFT. I think too, like you hear Chris Dixon talk about it, that, that take rate being the opportunity for Web3, a, a take rate of Twitter, it's 100% Twitter and the user effectively gets nothing that's generating all this content and eyeballs. Yeah. I mean, I think that does incentivize different behaviours because the user's effectively sharing in, in the upside as opposed to just creating value and, and not getting a monetary gain unless they're forced to, to advertise things that, that often pushes them into behaviours then they're not all that comfortable with in the first place. And I, I think that's right. And I think you could, see, you, you could see something like Uber scoring, right, on a social platform, um, which is driven by the users. Uh, and look, if you turn out to be a sort of pretty good moderator of a platform, hmm. you earn more of the currency in the platform. I can certainly see something like that happening. And then essentially you're a participant in the platform. You have the currency of the platform. Uh, and, and, you know, your effort in going, well, this is good content. Well, that's not appropriate. Is is sort of rewarded. I, I can certainly I can certainly see that that happening. But um, you know, it's it's quite a way away because yeah, we've been talking about this now for sort of I don't know a couple of years. These decentralized platforms, we've seen a few come and go. It's technically very difficult, and of course, you've got to overcome enormous incumbency, which which the current platforms have. I mean, everybody uh, talks about sort of discord and all the rest of it where other stuff happens but getting people off twitter off facebook it's hard and maybe you're you know as you say maybe paying them is the answer i think yeah like if, if nothing else crypto show how powerful incentives can be in in pushing behavior hasn't it yeah and so talk to me about blockchain gaming what are, what are you seeing there you've mentioned nfts and the role they're having in blockchain gaming do you think games will evolve and do you think blockchain or web3 gaming is is here to stay yeah i, I certainly do i mean i, I think it, it, when i look at sort of um blockchain gaming and it, say, say we look at the metaverse the sort of metaverse platforms like i, I don't know sandbox decentral land right we've got to be realistic on those platforms at the moment when you look at them the graphics are absolutely awful right it's like back to the 80s i actually find it appealing because that's my era of gaming and you know it's sort of I'm reminded of things that I played sort of 25 years ago, right? But that's not going to be compelling to a new audience. And, you know, when you're building a video game, it's a five to seven year process, right? So if we, if we think about the video game developers, they couldn't have been thinking about this, even if we're generous, they couldn't have been thinking about it for more than four years, right? Which means we're still three to four years away from having a decent game that's even considered this technology, right? And so for, certainly for the fund, when we look at this stuff, the first question is, is the game any good, right? I don't care if it's built on a blockchain. I don't care if it's got its own currency. Is it any good? And generally the answer is no, right? Because it's really, really difficult to build compelling, um, compelling games. Having said that, to me, it's a, it's a certainty that it will happen. Mm. It's a certainty that we're going to get a massive multiplayer online game that's bigger than a, a major economy in the world. So I, I fully expect to see in the next decade a game, and I don't know what it is, but I'm hoping to buy into it for the fund and uh, that say, you know, as big as the EU, right? Because these games are massive, right? There's billions and billions of dollars exchanging hands every day. I think the games will have their own currencies. I think they'll have NFTs in them. I know that people will pay for those NFTs because I've seen their behavior in the last 18 months. Will people spend thousands of dollars on the best sword and the best armor? And yeah, they definitely will. And it's going to be absolutely enormous. It's just that we're not there yet. And these, these iterations of games I see at the moment, the games are rubbish. Let's be honest, they're rubbish, right? So we, we're not there yet, but it's definitely coming. When you guys find out what the, the next game is, it's going to be bigger than the E. And once you've got your full allocation, you just send us a quick email and let us know. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you, you a heads pretty, up. We're fairly keen to jump on early as well. So I guess, I mean, I guess, so, so what are the things you're looking at? I mean, I think it's fair, 
you know, you can play the, and I'm not a gamer, but you compare the, the graphics and the, the storylines of AAA games compared to what's been built on the blockchain is, is chalk and cheese. But um, the community of some of these games, albeit if the gameplay isn't as fun as the, the AAA games, is quite enormous. You know, I think actually Infinity's got the most uh, Discord followers. I think they've maxed out their Discord numbers um, to a million or 800,000, whatever it is. Um, and then the ability of people, particularly in, in non-Western countries, to earn some income, income from a game is important. It's not something that people in Australia uh, care about or people in the US or Europe, but clearly for the millions in the Philippines, it's, it's been well, something they're wildly interested in and for some it's been important. Is it still just purely quality of the game? Are you, are you, are you putting any emphasis on those other areas as well when you're looking and thinking about what will be the next big thing in Web3 gaming? I look at it as a, as a test, right? Well, you know, you're describing that situation in the Philippines where people are earning money in these games. I look at that as, as a, a sort of test drive, right? So if you could imagine a scenario where we could break down sort of um, boring tasks into in the Western world, I don't know, banking, right? Let's just say in banking, somebody comes to work and does um, 10 things in the morning. It's the same thing every day, right? We break those down. And we turn them into a really cool video game somehow, yeah. right? I don't know how we do it. And then, um, then we put it out there and people around the world, whoever it is, wherever they are in the world, can play that game, solve the mini tasks and, and move and think they're playing a game, right? Yeah. To me, when you've got something underneath it that's of real economic value, well, then, you, then you're moving forward. I think some of the way that, that the money's being earned in these games it doesn't have an underlying real economic value, but but that doesn't make it not valuable. To me, it's the test drive, right? I can sort of see what's coming and I can sort of see what's going to happen, but it's not there yet because it's technically difficult to achieve, but it will come. And I, I think um, it, it will have a profound impact on the sort of global economy. You're going to get a big equalization of um, income across the world, right? Because you know, we're, we're pretty cosseted here in Australia, right? That you're not really at risk of being outcompeted by someone that's, uh, you know, in the Philippines. But in 10 years' time, you will be, right? So, you know, if you're sort of, if you're, if you're not um, highly skilled uh, in terms of technical, you, you, you're at risk from this stuff. And I think there's like sectors of the economy in Australia that I sort of worry for and sectors that I don't, you know, if you're if you're a if you're a tradie, which I think is a great example, they're absolutely bulletproof, right? Because mm. that stuff that they do is not going to be touched by this technology. If you're a sort of middle manager in a bank, you're kind of cooked, right? You you're going to be gone in ten years because this technology that you're describing, I think, will just be micro tasked into a game, and somebody somewhere, and we don't know who, will do it for you. The banks will still have the virtue signaling ads to fall back on. If you <laughs> they, they will. Well, so, that should insulate them. But I mean, you, you're seeing it already, aren't you? Like the Five Kingdoms is basically a decentralized finance app where people can trade crypto, add to liquidity pools, and become an automated market maker with a game skin dressed on top of it. You're essentially yep. doing things that either fund managers or, or everyday investors are doing every day, albeit there's graphics to make it look like you're playing a game. So it's like you said, it's it's here now. It's just probably not as sophisticated as where it's going to get to. Yeah. And let's face it, right? It, the, the world of traditional finance, it's a game, right? Yeah. Foreign currency trading, it's a game. You just got to be better than the guys on the other side of the world, right? That, 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 that's it. So it, it, it's perfect for uh, this kind of tech and, and you know, yeah, I, I see it going there like you. I just, I just don't think we're there yet. Can you see a, a world where, you know, with robotics and, and machines as they become more and more sophisticated, you know, could you see a, something being mined overseas through a video game and, and, and robotics in, you know, 20 years' time where you're playing the video game of mining copper or whatever and somewhere in, in Africa there, there's robots executing on, on what you're doing in the video game working out how much of the in-game currency you get coal get from the copper that's being sold or is it just too futuristic and stupid no i don't think it's futuristic and stupid at all i mean we had a guy in here yesterday actually trying to uh, trying to sell us drones right so he, he's he's got this idea of 
he's going to send drones up in Western Australia, right? And he's going to use a cryptocurrency and you can buy a cryptocurrency and essentially sponsor the drone to prospect out in WA, right? And, you know, you'll pay the fuel cost, the drone will go off and prospect. And if it's successful in its prospecting, you'll share in the returns of it, which is it's quite odd, but it's almost what you're saying, right? Yeah. So it's not that far then to send the sort of robots in to dig the hole. So look, I think it'll happen. But now whether, you know, whether it happens in the way that we think it'll happen, I don't know, but it's we're, we're pretty much there. And what do you say to people? There's, there's a lot of people, some of them really successful in a, a field which may end up being disrupted or other people that are just so sick of trying to get their head around new innovations that they're just, they're just tapping out and can't be bothered exploring things. What do you say if, if it's someone you care about and you, and you do actually want to try and shape their opinion, not that they have to like crypto, but how do you encourage people to explore this and, and to maintain an open mind? Or have you found it's near on impossible and people are either interested in exploring or they're not? Well, well, people are sort of interested. I, I, I kind of, um, I, I kind of gave up sort of a few years ago in terms of you know people would would sort of ask me about Bitcoin. Generally, when the price is going up, it's a topic of conversation, and then when it's going down, it isn't. But um, I, I think you can separate people into into cohorts, right? Younger people, and when I say younger, I'm sort of like 35 and under. They don't really have the same questions as the older cohort. They don't disbelieve it. They, they believe it, right? And they understand it. And they, they, they are suspicious of traditional institutions. They basically know that fiat currencies are a complete rule. They understand it, right? So they're there. And um, it's more um, older people who are distrustful and the ones that sort of need to be convinced that, you know, something's happening. You might want to participate. That's actually the cohort that's in our fund, right? Because, you know, they don't, have the technical skill to sort of engage with the assets that they're really the people that we represent. And actually many of them are sort of open-minded. And in some cases um, they go, look, you know, I don't believe it. I think it's nonsense, but I hear so much about it. I'll just be in the fund anyway, right? So it's quite interesting the approaches that people take. Um, but I would, I would sort of say to people, you know, fundamentally this is a really positive thing, right? I think it's tremendously positive for the world and what's happening because there's something wrong with the financial system that we've got at the moment and there's a lot of people working hard to, to make something that's a lot better i think it is a lot better and i think it will benefit a lot of people around the world as we as we go forward so i'm fundamentally like hugely positive about it i, I think it's going to be great and you won't be able to get away from it and so you know learn as much as you can you don't have to spend your money on it you don't have to go in funds like ours but just learn as much as you can about it and you'll slowly convince yourself. That's great advice. It's uh, the world's moving quickly, but it's the slowest it's ever going to move from here on in, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, might as well at least learn about it and see what all the fuss is about. But, mate, that's awesome, Dan. Thanks very much for coming on the show and, and having a chat. Really enjoyed it. So thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Chris. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.